Happy Friday, youth developer, Patty Zito, your lifestyle coach and nutritional therapy consultant at your service. Today, we have interview with action taker and youth developer, Debbie Banks. Debbie, I met her a few years ago in Austin, Texas. So shout out to all my friends in Texas. She, um, yes, and she was sharing about her new journey that you're about to hear in just a few minutes. And then she also talked to me about her new um, passion or something that she's currently working and that is as a grief recovery method specialist. So stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome to the Youth Developer. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. Yes. And I know that you are joining us. You're in Texas right now, correct? In Austin, Texas? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in Austin, Texas. Yes. In just a few minutes, we're going to get to see your RV, which I'm really excited to see it because you basically spoke to me about this vision and now you're there. When was that planted for you? Oh my goodness. Um, and I've been living in it now for a year, which is hard for me to believe that. Um, it's probably been about a four or five year development of the dream that I had. Yes. Um, as a family, we've gone away. My niece and nephews are all in sports, which travel quite a bit. And then we also take family trips um, for Thanksgiving. And there was one trip my sister and I took our mom in an RV from Orlando, Florida to Key West. Um, it was one of those uh, memory trips because we used to live in Key West. Mm. So all of those things got me thinking that, wow, when I'm not teaching in the classroom anymore, how could I travel around? And so I've got a couple of different certifications that allow me to take contracts all over the country. So I'm able to, to travel. Yes. So then I started downsizing and that was about a two-year process so shifting my mindset of living in a house to living in a much smaller space and not needing all the things that I had and through yard sales and just selling off different things <clears throat> giving away a bunch of stuff and so it was I'm glad I took that amount of time because I had to shift my mindset to be able to live in this small of a space and with all the things that I need to do. Part of that research process was um, scouring Facebook and YouTube videos about living in an RV. I wanted to know the experience before I actually experienced it myself. Um, I really believe that knowledge is power. <laughs> and so I wanted to understand. So um, that helped me a ton, um, even when I started researching and finally buying my RV. And I started speaking it to other people. I'm like, I'm going to do this, which was the craziest thing. Because it's Great accountability. Care. Yes, yes. Because I, uh, I believe that if I, if I was started saying it to people, then regardless of their reaction, it was going to put me on the path of I'm going to take action. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And then I had a really good friend of mine who went with me on a couple of trips to, to visit RVs and see them in person. Um, finally bought one last August, uh, moved into it. Now I haven't, because of COVID, I haven't traveled around um, outside of Austin. Um, and I'm okay with that because, you know, I, I, this is still a work in progress. Yes. And it's still a, a dream that's developing. Yes. So, yeah. And I, I, I work that. out of my RV too. I have, yeah, I teach online. So I've developed my own little classroom. Um, when gyms close down, I have an exercise mat. And so I actually can exercise inside my RV. I have my little home gym. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yes. It's your multi-purpose room, right? <laughs> yes. yes. I love I've it. I've learned to be an electrician. I've had to fix things. Um, YouTube is my friend and these different, I'm on different RV Facebook groups. So I ask lots of questions there and I've gotten some really helpful input, which I've found like, oh yeah, that really works. So, yeah. Nice. No, now, does your RV have a name? 
the name of my RV is Gideon. Mm. And that came out of the fact that Gideon in the Bible was this timid guy that was hiding, but he became this great man. And I thought, okay, this RV, I've been extremely timid. And there, that first year, believe me, there was a lot of tears. There were so many things I had to get used to. Driving it alone, I've gone from white knuckling it to actually being able to steer it when I drive it by just one hand. Like I'm much more comfortable. Um, so yeah, so Gideon is just reminds me, because he's also one of my favorite characters in the Bible, um, that God works in the big picture and not in the small parts that have been difficult for me to learn. Yeah. I mean, he works there too, but that's not <laughs> of <working>. course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I yeah. love that story. That is awesome. Well, we're ready. We're ready to yeah. uh, take a little sneak peek of your RV. <laughs> awesome. I was going to originally recover this, the couch, mm -hmm. and I decided instead I'm going to rip it out and build a desk here mm. so that I have an office area and I can have my dining area back. Okay. Um, and this is my little kitchen dinette area right yep. here. It's big. The and I, this big. is one of my favorite parts. Yeah. yeah. This is my favorite part is I have this little hallway right here. So in my hallway, I can go down. I can go my bathroom this way. And the bathroom's actually a nice size. It's only a 31 foot RV. So right. um, it's pretty big. Yeah. And then I have two ways to get into my bedroom. And then um, I have a full, this is a full closet and that's a full closet. So, you know, I've got plenty of mirror space. And here's that view that nice. was, I took a picture of. Get my shoes on here. Um, and I've started doing a lot of cooking outside because it's not as humid or as hot when I do that. So my, I've, I've been grilling a lot more. I bring my Instapot out here. Um, so here we go here, I've got my awning that is so nice, especially on the hottest of days. Yeah. Um, and RV's got his, uh, Gideon's got his own sunshades. I see. Right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then here's the outside. So that dining area and the, and the closet are slides. Mm -hmm. So they come out. Yeah. So yeah. I love There's, it. This is Gideon. You're like in a deck, right? That's your car I see in front of, is that your car? Yeah, that's my car. Okay. Yeah. And the particular site that I'm on actually makes it feel like I have my own little yard. Um, yes. Yeah. Every RV site is petitioned off this way, but mine happens to also be on this, um, like this little incline. Mm -hmm. type. It's hard to see. Um, so it makes it feel like I actually have my own, my own yard. It's like your backyard slash your own balcony, your deck. It, it has all of it. It has the, the feel for it. Yes. <laughs> this is, I'm it. sitting in my, my little lawn chair right now. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, is, I, and I, and I, I sit out in, the, in my window in the, on the couch. I can actually, a lot of times I can see red birds. Um, I figure mm. what they're called. They're not called red birds, but whatever they're called. Um, but different types of birds in this tree. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's so peaceful. I love it. It sounds peaceful. It sounds like you have peaceful neighbors too. I mean, yes, you would, right? Like this is a yes. lifestyle. I love it. One of the things that we talked about before this call was about grief recovery. And mm -hmm. so dying <laughs> to know about this uh, journey and, um, what what it has what it what it means to you and to your clients so i was a teacher for 20 years i teach i worked in the classroom i worked on the district level <clears throat> working with students with special needs yes. and then about 11 years ago i got introduced to the grief recovery method and that was for some personal work i was doing yes. um with some different losses um in my life and and it, there weren't even things necessarily I would have identified as a loss because mm -hmm. sometimes loss is really more a death or right. it can be a divorce or a breakup of a relationship and for me I had other areas I had relationships that just were not what I had wanted them to be and um, so then fast forward um, I decided I wanted to combine both of those passions in special education 
uh, the knowledge and experience I have there in working with families, as well as providing a way um, specifically for parents to be able to grieve however they need to with having a child with special needs. And I think that that that's just not addressed. Parents don't have a place where they can communicate that. And even amongst people that have children with similar disabilities, there's still going to be a different type of grief for each individual. Sure. And so I wanted to be able to provide that method to parents to guide them through being able to get complete with that. And they can have a more fulfilling relationship with their child, with other relationships in their family. Um, they can also, I can work with parents working with siblings. Um, siblings face the experience in an even different way than parents do. Um, and so I can provide a way to, to help communication through there so that even siblings can get to a place of completion with that grief. Right. So it, it allows me to have both those passions. Yeah, I love how you marry those two. And really, you're providing a, um, a social support too, right? When you, um, because it's the whole household is not, it's not just mm -hmm. one, it's not just child and parent, but like you said, like the siblings. Mm -hmm. So I love that. So in, um, in special education, was that in elementary or high school uh, when you were a teacher? Um, it was actually middle school and high school. And mm. um, it was a variety of providing behavior support, um, also executive functioning skills. And then on the high school level, those skills and providing what's called transition and okay. being able to train into students' employment skills, helping them get jobs, keep jobs. Um, right. On the district level, I worked um, with students from K through 18 plus um, with transition skills and helping them um, develop plans like where they are now, yeah. where they want to get in the future, and how do you build a bridge for those things to happen? Right. And relationships are so important to yes. those bridges and networking uh, that I, I wish we had more in, in school, but I'm, I'm glad that you were able to do that work in the DOE uh, system. Yeah. So that's great. It's great to hear that. That, that makes me yeah. <laughs> for sure. So Debbie, you, you said something very interesting that most people think about grief as a uh, that loss, losing someone like a death. Yeah. And um, you talked about that it could show up in different ways, as you said, mm -hmm. in relationships. So what yeah. would you say are some other myths that people have when it comes to that word grief? Mm -hmm. um, it comes in different ways because grief can even be when we're looking for forward to something hmm. but it's a change of anything that we've known um it grief is a change of um anything that's that's known or expected so hmm. for instance um when i moved from boston to texas I, I was leaving everything that i had known it was where i had done i had completed my undergraduate and graduate school i started my career in education um i had a social network um, that I was very tied into, and yet I was moving to Texas to be physically near my younger sister as she and her husband were starting to have children, and so I wanted to be around my niece and nephews, so it was yes. a, an exciting thing, and I was choosing to go to it, mm -hmm. but it was also a loss of mm -hmm. all the familiar, right. and so there, there was grieving that needed to happen there. Grief can come in job changes, where um, I've uh, had uh, one job where the, 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 the experience I had with the particular management that was happening, yeah. um, it got to a point of they were telling me either I could go, I could leave, um, or I would be on probation. So it was partly that I could make a decision, partly that a decision was being made for me. Mm. And so there was... There, there's grief right there. You know, yeah. it, can, it was, you know, a feeling of powerlessness. Yeah. Um, and then there are also a lot of lies that were told about grief. Um, there are ways that we're told to handle it. One might be, um, let's say we lose a puppy um, mm. or lose a child. And there's no comparison of those losses, but 
sometimes what we were told is, well, you can have another one. Mm. You know, a puppy might be go and replace it. Yeah. Um, there might be um, ways that we deal with grief where um, we work really hard. We just become workaholics because we're not dealing with the grief, mm-hmm. the processing. Yes. Um, there can also be uh, one, a friend of mine was told this not long ago. She was 12 when her mother died and she was talking to a, uh, a friend who was 11 when their mother had died. And what the friend mm-hmm. said to the 12 year old was, I mean, that 12 year old is now in her twenties, An but, <laughs> me- but the memory of the experience was that well, at least you had your mom for 12 years. Hmm. That didn't address the emotional part. A lot of times with grief, um, what we're either don't know how to communicate that we're grieving or others don't know how to hear us because we get feedback and they try and fix us and we don't need to be fixed because we're not broken. Um, It also might be that we have these hopes and dreams and expectations of what we would want life to look like or this, or a relationship to look like. And they, that doesn't happen. Yeah. And so that those are experiences where grief starts setting in and we can start isolating ourselves because we haven't had the words to communicate it. Others haven't had the ability to hear or we yeah. haven't felt heard. Yeah. Or, you know, then if we just don't have, you know, we have those broken dreams and expectations. Yeah, that's really good. One of the things you said um, that uh, will actually get me upset (laughs) is uh, not allowing the space for someone Mm -hmm. to go through. Right. Because as you mentioned, um, and, and I know we do it with great intentions, you know, when you love someone. Um, However, trying to want to fix someone, it's very dangerous. It's Uh enabling someone to go through the process. um, And and, and really, you know, um, and I know I'm sensitive to the word overcoming. However, what I'm saying is that it, when we try to fix someone, we don't allow the process and the growth of the other person and everyone's time is different, right? Just like you mentioned with the 11 year old and the 12 year old. Yeah. That must've been like a 12 month difference, but it was, it's where we're uniquely made it's different experiences Mm -hmm. so we don't know what was her relationship with her mother for the 12 year old and the 11 year old so um i think that's something really good to share um especially with parents um this channel we call it the youth developer because we believe that the best form of youth development is by us the adults Mm -hmm. not the children it's by us the adults living our life to the fullest right can you imagine children living in a household where parents are love to drop their full energy and they're living by their calling right what an inspiring thing to do you know and one of the things that we Mm -hmm. I like to say is that we don't believe that the children are the future um yeah sure later but the Mm -hmm. future is now right with us Uh, the adults so I think that's a really good thing Uh to share with our audience you know to really allow the time and the space um, because I, I can relate to all these things uh, that you are mentioning um, with, you know, and one, one, um, one a question, um, what would be one advice besides giving time and space for others? Um, what would be something for a parent who um, is not able to, I, I don't know if the word is compassion, who does not have compassion under middle school child loss of a friend like I guess Uh to the parent it could be you know yes we move but that's that's just you know that's just your best friend you're going to make new friends in the future Uh right so Uh because you mentioned about this whole transition and 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 it made me think about parents right now who are currently struggling with their kids in middle school like yeah I my child was like the best child in elementary I don't know what happened (laughs) Yeah. I don't know if you get that, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I, I get that question all the time. So since yeah. we're in this topic, what will be uh, some advice for a parent? You know, the, the first thing that comes to mind is the training that I had in the whole transition process. Okay. That's 
you know, that the educational transition. <laughs> um, and with that is understanding that anytime we start something new, there's going to be a level of, of incompetence. And I don't say that in a negative, critical sure. way. I say that that's just the way to describe I'm not able. Yeah. Um, for instance, I taught for 20 years. And in that time, I taught in three different school districts, taught for over 20 years, mm -hmm. three different school districts. And so when I switched from Boston, where I was teaching, um, I had, I was a leader on the team that I was in. Um, I was um, as high as I could really go in my career at that point, but it was in a, it was in a private school, mm -hmm. um, private residential treatment school, actually. And then I moved to Texas, where I'm in a public school. And they had hired me to start a program. So they were recognizing my experience, but I had never taught in public school before. I had, you know, it was a huge district here in Austin. And, you know, I had to know who are my supports, who are my go-to people. So in that experience, I was incompetent. Sure. Like mm -hmm. I had, you know, and so I would say, even with a parent, if you've got a child that they've navigated through elementary school and they're a rock star, they're doing great. And then they get to middle school and they're floundering. Yeah. Understanding that that's normal. Mm -hmm. That when we start something new and on top of it, the child has all these different hormones going on. Sure. So they don't have the level of understanding and uh, of their body sure. and of hormones. And so I think parents just being present and sometimes mm -hmm. it's just being a better listener, mm -hmm. not not trying to um, provide direction or feedback. That is necessary mm -hmm. and it, in time. Right. But one of the biggest things I found with students is that they just wanted to know that someone heard them, yes. that they listened, yes. you know, and being able to acknowledge. And in our busy world, and right now with parents juggling even more, because yes. now many of them are stay-at-home teachers sure. as well as their own profession. Mm -hmm. um, that's hard. And I think it takes intentionality of having those moments of yeah. just being present. I love that. I love that. I, I moved to the United States when I was in middle school, I was 11 yeah. going on 12. And, yeah. and for me, everything was new. The language was new. Uh, yeah. uh, the culture, I mean, talk about culture shock for me. And uh, it's so true. Yeah. And I love how you said, um, it's the word that you use incompetent, right? Is that the word that you yeah. use? Yeah. And, and yeah. the way I see is that we, you know, we all, before we run, we got to learn how to walk. And before we walk, yeah. we got to learn how to crawl. And before we crawl, we got to learn yeah. how to get on our bellies, right? So there's yeah. a process to that. Yeah. That's a great, yeah. that's a, that's a, I love that. And, and that's yes. something that um, I'm currently learning to give myself mm -hmm. grace myself, right? Because yeah. we, we go through, yeah. okay, I understand my boundaries. I understand that I cannot control people. I am taking right. responsibility. And so now that I'm dealing with Patty, <laughs> I need to give yeah. Patty, I get to get, yeah. I, I get to give Patty some, some space. I'm going to take off my headset in case that was that. My mom came in when you were, were talking. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. <laughs> the camera. <laughs> uh, I have a group that I, uh, I'm part of with my coaches. It's my, it's my network. And so uh -huh. new language work. I think I mentioned that to you. And uh -huh. so, um, one of the, <laughs> one of the, uh, we call a one word game. It's, uh -huh. um, write down in a piece of paper. I have a problem with whatever okay. you want to put in, um, uh -huh. what are the feelings that come with that? Uh -huh. So for me, I wrote, I have a problem with living in this apartment, right? In this uh -huh. house. And what's the feeling frustrated and exposed. Uh -huh. So you yeah, know, my, my colleague was okay. Oh, tell tell me a little bit more about exposed. So you know, I, I kind of showed her. I was like, okay, you see that door? It's a cute French door. Yeah, but that's the entrance to uh -huh. my mother-in-law. And now, do you see this? <laughs> that's the entrance to my mother's <laughs> apartment. So I'm basically the mom sandwich in my apartment. This is my office. In my apartment, yeah, we're literally the mom sandwich. 
And so, yeah. <laughs> and because it's called the, the one word game, the next step is to say, okay, scratch out problem and write opportunity. So mm-hmm. I have an opportunity with living. Wow. Right? What's the feeling to that? Wow. I'm, I'm grateful that I'm here. I'm grateful I have my mom, both our mothers, you know. Uh-huh. I'm writing this down. This is amazing. Yeah, it's the power of words, right? Wow. The power of words. So um, yeah. I love that. I might keep this for the video. Why not? Even though with the family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, love it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Debbie, I I, I love, I, I think these two, the, the myth of uh, grieving and giving a tip on transition, these are two lovely tips that we could we could talk for a long time, but I think they're simple uh, and they're practical. And, and the one thing I wanted to share, what I was sharing before, is that it's, um, it's giving ourselves that grace. Because if we don't start with our own self-care, yeah. our soul care, we're not going to be as effective. We're not gonna really going to give out of a full cup to our children. Uh, would, you, would you say that's fair enough to focus? Right on us first yes yes because even with when i'm working with um people with their grief recovery i say gift yourself this opportunity yes gift yourself opportunity of going through it's an it's an eight class course to guide people through gift it to you you know i gift myself a sabbath day every week i have a day where it started, it initially started out with just a couple of hours I would set aside to do no, no regular work. Mm-hmm. And then I've been over the past couple of years, I've built it into now I can give myself a day. Yeah. But it took a long time shifting that mindset. Yes. So I completely agree with you that we have to, to play. I love how you have that in one of your videos, give ourselves time to play. Yeah. Um, and we have to give ourselves time to rest. So yes, I completely agree with you. We can learn uh-huh. so much from the Jewish culture. Like I'm really literally approaching my Bible as an interactive process yeah. of like, instead of uh-huh. applying, it's more responding. And when you want to respond, you got to oh, first I love that. be able to listen. Yeah. Because when we apply, yeah. it's all about us. Okay, let me grab this and do that. But when we respond, we got to like slow down to listen. So that in itself has been a a huge paradigm shift for me. So I love that you said that. So um, what are some, um, how can people get in touch with you in case they do want to be part of this program that you mentioned? Um, How can they get in touch with Uh you? Well, I have a microsite on the griefrecoveryinstitute.com website. and then I'm in Austin. And so I do my work uh, in person and we do it socially distanced with all the precautions. Um, I just prefer that. Um, and then I also have uh, people can contact me through db.griefrecoveryspecialist.com. And then I have a Facebook page, um, Excel with them. Hmm, I like the and, name. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you're in the middle of nature and what would you say are your top three favorite things about living in an RV or the um, mobile lifestyle right now for you? Um, I do love the fact that it's mobile, that if I don't like where I'm living, I can just go. (laughs) If you don't Um, like your neighbors. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, I... I love um, the peacefulness. Mm. It is so peaceful out here. I love that. And I actually have really enjoyed just living in a minimal way. Like all the stuff that I got rid of, um, even that has been freeing, just not to have stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And living on just as, I don't wanna say as little as possible, there, I mean, I do have a small storage area where I kept a few of my really um, favorite pieces of furniture, yeah. but, but really it's a minimalist lifestyle. 
and that has just been freeing. Yeah. Yeah. I follow yeah. Tiny How's Big Journey. Yes. Uh, and yes. That's exactly what you just said, right? It is yeah. tiny, but the j- journey ahead of you, it's, it's huge, right? The possibilities yes. are huge. Yes. I love it. Yes. We follow the same person. <laughs> do you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you know of Gone with the Winds? They used to do RV and now yes, they're still- Yes. <laughs> yes, I've read some of their stuff. <laughs> oh, they are they give so much value. I know they have Patreon as well, but their yeah. YouTube, it's it should be like a school uh for people who have RV. Wow. They're so good in detail and their website is very mm-hmm. helpful. So I love Yes. Them. Yes. I love it. Yeah. All right. Well, Debbie, we're outside. I know you're going to enjoy your view. Um, thank you for coming and spending your Friday with us, uh, sharing a bit of your journey in, in, in your tiny home, big journey, uh, as well as what you do yeah. <laughs> for grief um, mm-hmm. recovery method that you mentioned. Uh, so guys, uh, mm-hmm. please, if you like this interview, give it a like. If you want to hear more interviews with action takers like Debbie, hit the subscribe button mm-hmm. and the bell so you can be notified on the next big adventure. And if you want to meet with Debbie, leave any questions here, or you could also reach mm-hmm. her as she mentioned in her website. And I will link that in the description below, as well as put it right here, right under your screen. So you can get in touch with her. Mm-hmm. Uh, Debbie, again, thank you for spending a little bit of your Friday with us, sharing your big journey and for giving value to this community. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I love what you do and I look forward to being in touch and talking to you again. Take so, care. Take care, Debbie.